We're going to talk about education, legislation, and enforcement now. Uh, they are all three separate areas, and I think this is going to be one of the more uh, dynamic parts of the, of the panel here. Uh, I'll do my best to cause trouble. So <laughs> I'm first going to start with uh, Molly, who's with uh, Students Against Distracted Driving. So Molly, tell us first a little about yourself and then your thoughts on this. Yeah, so like you said, my speak name into is, the oh, microphone. Yeah. My name is Molly, and I'm actually still in high school, so I have a unique perspective on teens, but also parents with distracted driving. So I think one of our main focuses at SAD is to really uh, engage students to take on their own personal responsibility. And I think along with distracted driving, that can go with maybe even something we talked about cost efficient. Something that doesn't cost anything is if you're with a passenger, to give them the phone and say, here's my phone. If I get a text message from my mom or my grandma or my family members, let me know. But if it's just a friend and you can tell it's just a funny message, just leave it and let me know I have a text. But just really, you take control of my phone. I don't have to worry about it. And I can keep driving and staying focused. So I think that's a real key part in making sure that you're taking your own personal responsibility behind the wheel. Uh, just thank you. <laughs> personal responsibility. That's a key takeaway, I think, for all of us. So uh, it's not always somebody else's fault. So we have to be responsible for our, our own activities. So let's get into some of the legislative aspects of this, and I'm going to turn to Jennifer Smith, who knows more about legislation and distracted driving than I think anybody on the planet here. So, Jennifer. Um, well, this is where I want to try to give some good news, is that we are finally starting to see a tide turn when it comes to legislation. Um, and I'm going to bring up one state that kind of has similar statistics to Missouri, and that's Georgia. They saw a 34% increase in fatal crashes from 2014 to 2016, 2017. Just like here in Missouri, I think you said it was 35% since 2014. Well, what they did was they formed a study committee and we went around the state with a panel of 10 representatives and we held all day long meetings to learn about the issue from all different perspectives to develop a plan on what to do next. The best thing they said they could do was pass a hands-free law. This law is written so you cannot hold your phone or support it with any part of your body. So it cannot be on your lap, it can't be taped to your head, which has been done before. Wow. You can't have it anywhere on you. It does, it's not required to be an amount, but or and it's also not a one-touch law like a lot of states are doing. But it has been successful in changing the numbers. Uh, this went into effect July 1st of 2018. There was about a 90-day grace period. Fatal crashes, severe injury crashes have all gone down in the state since then. Um, 2017, the committee hearing started. 2018, you know, people don't know how a bill becomes a law. So when it passed the House, they thought it was a law. When it passed the Senate, they thought it was a law. When the governor signed it, they thought it was a law. They didn't know there was an effective date. And you couldn't even buy a hands-free device in the state of Georgia leading up to the law because people were so aware of it. This was driven by the families. They were at the Capitol every day, every hearing, walking the halls. There were two days. They were there for 14 hours each. Um, they have reduced fatal crashes about 4% in that first time. Looking at 2019 through July 1st, they're about 5% down on fatal crashes. But the biggest numbers, pedestrian fatalities are down over 20%. Bicyclist fatalities down over 40%. Motorcyclists down about 10%, intersection crashes down 10%. We also have been able to get the telematics data. Telematics is a user-based insurance. You put an app on your phone. It, it determines how you're using your phone. The telematics data shows that on the day the law went into effect, drivers were typing and swiping 22% less. And that's continued to go down with enforcement starting up more and more. You know, Every time there's a big enforcement uptick, you see the telematics <coughs> drop again. This has led to uh, insurance rates either stabilizing after a 12.6% increase or even going down 2.5%. Traffic commute times have improved. It, it's working. So traffic commute times, has, have any of you been on a multi-lane highway with somebody in the left lane kind of doing about 10 miles an hour below the speed limit? Mm -hmm. Has that ever happened to you and you know full well what they're doing? 
Is that maddening? Yeah, yeah. Um, following the money, I think, is a, is a great uh, point, and insurance uh, affects all of us. So um, from the insurance industry, just very quickly, what difference does this make? Does this save you guys a bunch of money, which then, of course, you will pass on to us? <coughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing a smile down there, but uh, <laughs> I, I shouldn't be. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I think I've done that very effectively. So, uh, <laughs> just uh, from a State Farm standpoint, um, I think that uh, it's an opportunity for us to tie incentives to safe driving behavior. Um, that both helps the bottom line for the consumer and, and for the insurance companies. And one example that we have of that, um, Officer Erig mentioned incentives in the previous session. The lack of incentives or the presence of incentives can make a big difference on driving behavior. State Farm has two discount programs for auto insurance that are based on incentivizing safe driving behavior. They're technology based. Mm -hmm. Uh, one is called Drive Safe and Save, and it uses telematics and um, uh, phone technology to monitor your driving while what, you drive. What Jennifer was talking about. Yes, yeah. and um, it provides that objective analysis of your driving that gets outside that confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. And it provides a positive incentive. The higher your score, the better your discount will be. It grades your driving on speeding, um, acceleration, braking, uh, hard cornering, and also cell phone use and you see a score for this displayed after every trip you take. And so it provides a positive incentive. And so I think this is one thing. Is that we have offered a, here in, in the state of Missouri? It is. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a, a teen driver safety program as well called Steer Clear. It's also a discount program. And that uses similar technology to evaluate a teen's driving uh, ability. But it also includes an educational component where they go through educational modules. They have some mentoring from parents and, and friends and family. So, these are designed to build in a lot of positive incentives mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to complement maybe the, the the enforcement or the, the criminalization. Um, that Catching can more flies with honey than yes, with vinegar. That can benefit both the um, the insurance industry and the drivers and the, the community as a whole. So, uh, absolutely a win-win. Um, Jennifer, I have just one more question here. I'm, I'm curious as to what type of tape these people use to attach the phone to the side of their head, and did they have much hair or were they bald? I, this, this could, I mean, make a big difference. And they tape it to their steering wheels. They do all types of weird things. I mean, you've seen it all. We've heard about it all. But, and I, I wanted to also add, you know, not only Georgia, <clears throat> since Georgia passed their law, four other states have passed a law. And so all hope isn't lost for Missouri because one of those other states that did not even have a texting law was Arizona. Mm -hmm. And this year, um, a couple weeks before session started, a police officer was killed at the scene of a crash. And that spurred the Arizona legislature. Now, it was not easy. It never is. But they were able to pass a hands-free law in Arizona as well, along with Tennessee, Minnesota, and Maine. And so Okay, uh, Missouri, uh, you've, you've got an example. If, if, if Arizona can get away with it, you certainly can. Kip, your challenges, um, again, on the uh, uh, House floor, and who's, who's objecting, uh, and, and why are they objecting? I mean, again, we talk about personal freedom and Fourth Amendment, but this has really nothing to do with Fourth Amendment that I can see. <laughs> See, I'm doing well. The second session, I'm putting people on the spot here on a regular basis, but that's we want to get to the bottom here. He's choosing um, his words carefully. Yeah, I am. I, I try to always, uh, yeah, I try to speak carefully on this. Um, so, well, yeah. the. The reality of Missouri is, uh, with, I mean, without getting, I mean, I, I'm going to speak as if I'm a, I am a partisan, right? I mean, I, I have a letter behind my name, of course, right? But I'm going to try to speak as objectively as possible here. Uh, and it may come across as, uh, as partisan, so I apologize for that. Uh, in, in, in Missouri, we have a supermajority uh, of Republicans, a supermajority of Democrats. Uh, a majority party, in any case, um, especially when you get to a supermajority, doesn't necessarily like to rely on a minority party uh, to pass 
a bill out of a house. I mean, that just becomes problematic because if you're relying on a minority party, when you have the votes to get something out of the house, that means that there's a split within your caucus. And there is a split in uh, the Republican caucus on this and the majority caucus on this, where you would see um, potentially more conservative, uh, a more conservative caucus uh, be opposed to um, increasing statutes related to um, to this and, and to potentially other issues as well. And so I think that that's kind of where the split came uh, that we've seen and what has kind of stopped this from necessarily receiving the traction that it should. Uh, I think, I mean, say, saying that I think that the majority of, uh, of members of the majority party would be in support of, uh, of substantive legislation. I think that there is somewhat of a divide in the caucus on how to move forward. So a question that I alluded to at the beginning is, what's the difference between DUI and distracted driving? They are both intentional acts and they both result in exactly the same outcome. So how do we, how do we somehow, uh, what's the difference here? I'm, I, I'd, I'd like to understand how that, uh, Patrick. Well, I think a couple of things. Um, number one, I think it's more difficult to prove. Uh, so it's a challenge for enforcement. It's a challenge for reporting. Uh, I, I don't think there's a dispute on the outcome being similar. Uh, but in, in regard to, you know, I don't think we should look at this as the legislature either did or didn't do something, whether it's here in Missouri or anywhere else. Um, this is representative government. Mm -hmm. uh, the legislature is reflecting the constituent concerns that are expressed to them. And certainly here in Missouri, there's not a separation from that individual liberty uh, in government imposing additional restrictions on that liberty. Now, that is the issue uh, as far as I have witnessed it. I'm not a part of the legislature, but I certainly witnessed the actions there. Again, this comes right back to people getting involved, individuals getting involved in expressing their concerns, if mm -hmm. this is an area that and should concern everyone. Um, let the legislature know. Let your representatives know what your feelings are on this. I think that's a big takeaway. Jennifer. Shameless plug on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, that's what we want to come down here and help with, just like we have in all of those other states, is that the, the problem is the legislators are not up to speed with where the public is because they haven't heard from them. They do need that very built coalition effort showing them that, you know, polling over 90% of the public is in support of these laws. All of the major corporations and entities in the state are in support of these laws. There is virtually no opposition. And when it comes to the enforcement part, the way that we write these hands-free laws, it removes all the loopholes. We include you can't watch, record, or broadcast photos or videos, and that you have to have the phone clearly out of your hand. So for enforcement, it's very clear. If the phone is in your hand, you're in violation. It doesn't matter what your excuse is, you had that phone in your hand. So that with the public understanding and making their voices heard and educating the lawmakers. We're not saying you can't do this. We're not saying you can't do that. You just have to do it in this law-abiding manner, and that's when the reductions will come. I guess, you know. Oh, I forgot the shameless plug, though. Oh, wait, wait. All right. <laughs> uh, if you go on Facebook, we have a page called Hands Free Missouri, and we ask everyone just follow along with that, and we'll, that's where we will run this campaign through, helping the legislature. We will post up every committee hearing, every, every floor vote, you know, who we need to let know that w is, we're in support of this bill, and that's how you get it done. I guess I would say to the audience here, everybody here knows at least 20 or 30 people. You can make a difference by speaking to them about this and say, hey, you know, this is important. And ask them the question, as I've just asked uh, Representative Kendrick here, about what's the difference between this and DUI, and how does this impact your freedom, and again, the right to swing your fist up to the point of impact, that's fine. The problem is that we can't put the toothpaste back in the tube after the, uh, the point of impact. Mayor Turgan, you've been uh, passionate about this and so forth, and you've taken some steps uh, for the uh, city of Jefferson, have you not? Yes, we have. Not as many steps as we would like to. This is the most important thing 
that I could do as far as enacting legislation that would save lives uh, in the capital city. And when Columbia passed their legislation, I was so excited and gung-ho and went right to our city attorney who used to work for Columbia and works for us now and said, okay, Columbia just passed it. Let's get this going in Jeff City and realized the preemption clause and realized very quickly how deflated I felt after having that conversation so with him. explain the preemption clause. So since this is a, it's not allowed by the state, so a city can't necessarily preempt state law and say that some of these laws can be enacted at the local level when they're not permitted at the state level. So some cities have gone on and passed legislation, uh, and this could be debatable because this is, could be attorney's of, of, advice, of course, so I would tell you course, everybody can debate on this, but understanding that some cities that have passed, for one, I'm very thankful, I'm very grateful for cities that have taken that step to pass this legislation. It's not easy to do. The state hasn't even done it, and good for any city, including Columbia, and any city that's going to pass legislation. I'm proud of them. I wish we would do it, but understanding that it is more ceremonial and not in, is enforceable because of the state law challenges that there's not a state law. So. Putting all those um, <clears throat> considerations aside and due process and all the things that we would have to face that it would be unenforceable in our city if we enacted it, we've had to have more of the, the um, grassroots effort of you know the buckle up, phone down, and reminding everybody at the local level we took the challenge. So we you know our city took the challenge, the county took the challenge. We've declared buckle up, phone down day for our third year now in the city of Jefferson in the capital city. Uh, but I think the challenge is that as a mayor. I cannot do what I think is one of the most important things because we are held back by state law. And I appreciate Representative Kendrick for your forward thinking and being here today because it'll take legislators like you to help us break through that challenge. I think this year we're in the best position we have ever been because Georgia has an excellent law. They're a great example. So, so it now, would be a good model a to follow. You wouldn't have to create anything here. Right, and, and MoDOT has done a fabulous job over the years of bringing good examples, but I think that now, as we are the show me state and everybody has to show us, the data, as you mentioned, Jennifer, is there to show legislators. And I think some of us that are also elected officials realize, and, and I went to a conference and I wrote this down, and this is how Georgia did it, and one of the quotes was, the public supports these laws even though elected officials might be hesitant. Well, might is an understatement in the state of Missouri. The public does support these laws, and it is a great question when we look at the why. Why do our legislators have hesitancy in enacting it? And like you said, Mr. Kendrick, there can be a partisan element to it, but really why? If we asked every single legislator, we know the public supports it, but would any legislator go on the record and say, here's why I think it's okay to be distracted while driving? I would love to hear that. And I think that they get very caught up, and I understand being an elected official, getting caught up in some of the details that really don't matter. They're distracted themselves inside the Capitol by what distractions they're going to ban. And I think that, it, and it's true, that's and if you quote, haven't heard. That's a quote worth preserving. <laughs> but if you haven't heard, well, what about distracting? You know, you can't drink a bottle of water. What about eating a hamburger while you're driving? And I am definitely not for any distractions, but I think that it's so proven, the psychological connection with the phones and the distraction that's at the level of, of impaired driving, yet we can argue about a hamburger and, and the, well, the science, I think the science is pretty compelling. I will say on the food, stay away from the spaghetti, though. There's, well, there's no question exactly. about that. But it, it's something that requires two hands. But why uh, we can't just pick the one distraction that we know clearly yeah. is, is well, definitely... Uh, you, have, you have a good advocate right here who can point to it. I mean, and our role at NTSB is... Um, the only reason I'm here, I'm an equal opportunity insulter, as you've probably <laughs> noticed. And... Um, we're absolutely nonpartisan, and last I checked, crashes occur on a nonpartisan basis. Mm -hmm. So this is really not a partisan issue, and if we have the science here to support it, so it's not my opinion or your opinion or, or uh, your opinion, it's, it's what the, the facts say, then we need to go from there. And we've shared that message about, uh, we have a group of mayors across the state of Missouri, so last year the Missouri Mayors United for Progress, led by Mayor Sly James from Kansas City, and he, he mentioned just that, that it is a nonpartisan issue, um, that uh, we passed uh, 
a resolution asking for support of legislators to pass hands-free legislation and a primary seatbelt law. Mm -hmm. Very good. So we are trying to have a voice in, in as much as we can to speak yeah. with to legislators and, and help. And one other point which I think sometimes gets lost in, in our media uh, environment world is you can have a, a dissenting view but still be very respectful to people about why you feel the way you do. Kip, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, too, I, it, the conversations have been had within the building, and again, when I mentioned uh, potentially more conservative members, I, I mean, I think that I fair, represented their views fairly well. I think they wouldn't necessarily disagree. I think that there's also um, a, a potential, you know, it, it, people's minds can be changed on this. I mean, you, I, and I think Well, we've seen it in other I, states. Right, I mean, I think a lot of people could come around on this issue. I think, again, it's just say this a hundred times today, it just goes back to education being uh, being organized and being in the building and being active uh, and, and educating members of the General Assembly. I mean, as Mayor Turgeon said, there's a tremendous amount of distractions inside the building. Uh, I mean, at any one day, I mean, you're talking about, you know, a hundred different issues uh, that impact people's lives. And so this is about being organized, keeping this in our face, and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll see some traction. So, I, I wonder if it makes sense to organize or put together some kind of a petition that could be taken to show, in fact, that the public does support this and make it easy, do it online. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I don't know what I'm talking about, which qualifies me perfectly for my job here today. But uh, something that would be able to show them, you know, here's, you know, 40,000, 50,000 people who feel that this is, you know, an important thing. It's not, you know, Jefferson City Mayor saying, you know, you should do this. And thankfully to MoDOT, a lot of that exists if how many thousands have taken the Buckle Up Phone Down Challenge online. So I think that's some good data to say we support that. And I think that figuring out what the hangups are and certainly working with representatives who are proactive like Representative Kendrick, what are the hangups? And I think we do hear over and over enforcement is a hangup. Why would we enact something that would be a challenge being enforced? And as I learned from other seminars and sessions that the law enforcement agencies that do enforce it well have very, I, I, easy is not the word, but they are enforceable is the word. It is enforceable. It is. Mm -hmm. It can be done, and other states that do it well can be used an ex example here. And some of us could say and, we could go we out on any given day. And we have examples to share with the legislature on yes. that. Yes, and mm -hmm. we can identify it ourselves very easily. You see it consistently, but it can be done through the law enforcement right. angle. Right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Rick, you had a question. I, I think oftentimes we limit ourselves in thinking about policy work happening either at the state level or even at the local level, but I think we forget about another level of policy that can happen that we've had great success at SAD, and that's working through our local boards of education and our local school boards. So I served on a school board for six years, that's why my hair turned gray, and what I learned is that there's a lot that school boards can do to shape the culture of a community by putting policies in place that have a repercussions and consequences for teens who choose not to wear their seatbelt on school property. There are parking privileges that can be revoked. There are offenses that can be tied to distracted driving. So I know that there are a number of barriers that can take place in more wide spaces of policy, but boards of education and that local policy still can be very effective, and our students are really the ones that drive that bus, no pun intended, where they really are making a difference in getting their boards of education involved to, to hear their concerns, and then that patchwork quickly spreads in a community as we saw in places like Ohio, where I know we worked with Jennifer and some other partners on some legislation there, too. Who's got the best education program in the country? Which state? I, again, I'm putting people on the spot on the second panel here, so be aware. It could come to you. I think, I think that's a complicated question. <laughs> I think it depends on how you how you you know, qualify education. I know there are a lot of great states in the Midwest, a lot of great states on the coast. That that's a great, great slither. What, yeah. what, would you, what would you say, though, from, just from your perspective, nobody's yeah. going to hold you to it, yeah. uh, what, what would you say would be one of the most effective ways of, of doing this? And Molly, please jump in yeah. and correct him if he she's, needs to. I was going to okay. say, she's the, she's the expert. She's still yeah. in school. Uh, but, you know, I really have enjoyed a lot of the work that's coming out of New Jersey. They put a strong presence on driver education, which we know is important. There are connections to the classroom. Their GDL laws are absolutely fabulous with the sticker that, that, de that delineates who is a, a, a novice driver and a young driver. So there's a lot of great work coming out of there. So they're um, putting a sticker on the vehicle? Is so that there's a sticker that actually goes on the license plate, which denotes that, that the driver of that vehicle could be a novice driver. Obviously, there are other people that could be driving the vehicle. Can I get one of those? I, I, that would really... Oh, 
you qualify for sure, sir. Uh, but it, it gives, it's a tool for law enforcement to help them identify that, hey, here's a vehicle that could be potentially uh, a novice driver. It helps with things like curfew, uh, driver restrictions. All those problems we've heard from law enforcement when it comes to enforcing GDL can somewhat be remedied. Obviously, there's challenges there still, but some great information and certainly something to consider. Molly, Molly. what do you think? Um. I would agree. I really enjoy it. and I think that there, New Jersey is a great example for like education of how to go about it. An interesting thing too, when we were talking about like for Missouri, how the people want this law too, is that it, I live in Indiana. So even at like my age, there's still teens and you know younger people who are coming up. You know, we're learning about voting, how to vote, what we want, and what we stand for. I think it's interesting that even we want these laws to take place. We want a safer environment, and we want a safer nation. So I think when you tie all that together, the education that can come from just being in schools in general, and really, my school ran a program where we had one day we had people put their phones away each class period and they could check it during the passing periods. And it was interesting to see the people, they would come out of their classrooms and they'd like check their phones, they'd almost get relief. So they're learning and they said that they, they knew what was happening in class more, <laughs> they could pay attention to their friends more and it's interesting just that they're finding out that they don't need their phones as much as, as along so with life, knowing what they stand for. Life really does exist outside yeah. of having <laughs> your cell phone. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's good. Frank, you spend quite a bit of time on education and uh, uh, these sorts of things. Uh, you're a survivor advocate. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you're, what you're doing on the education side of things. I... Speak into the microphone, please. Uh, yes. <laughs> what I do is um, I go around to the schools and I discuss uh, um, all the concerns of distracted driving with the uh, the students and whatnot. I also have worked with the uh, Missouri State Patrol. Um, Officer Parrott, he actually helped me um, do the first one I ever did. Um, I did it for Crowsville High School uh, the year that my daughter would have been a senior. It happens to be that my uh, seminar that I do, um, it It was put together by the help that I had was uh, by one of her classmates. Um, I don't show just something I pulled off a computer. I don't show uh, things that I just pulled up. I show uh, even her crash scene photos. I go in and, I, and, and, and with that said, what I'm able to do is I get reality I do more of a reality education than, hey, what you can just go on, you know, any any kid can go on here and find a whole lot of gory stuff on the internet in today's world. But what I do is more of a education to show that there's people like myself and my son who has helped me put this seminar on that have lost family members and it's real to us and it's real to the some of these some of these kids will, uh, will come to me and, and they've gone with me some of our classmates and friends um, to to speak and we're bringing reality to help out. So that like gets it beyond the statistic control. mode and into you know the the individual tragedies that are repeated thousands of times every year right. across the country. And so. see. Well, I, the crash scene photos, um, the, the hardest thing that I have to do is every time that I put this on, I actually show the photo of her in a body bag. I show my daughter in a body bag. Why? Because she was distracted. And I lost her that day. And in that school year, in that little school district of 18 down there in Boot Hill, Missouri, we lost three children. That's that too year. many. And that's entirely too many. Yeah. So someone had to speak up and that someone was me. Thank you. And so that's the reason I do what I do and I, and I do as much as I can to educate as many children. And I get the adults involved. I, at first I thought, I'll just do this with the kids because it's easier. Well, you know what? You got to get the adults involved too, because somebody said something down here about experts a while ago, 
And I want to point something out. Okay, I was about eight years old when I learned how to drive out there on the farm. I'm 47 now. I'm an expert driver. I can't text worth nothing. You know? You can't put the two together. These kids, they can hold their phones behind their backs. Text you a three-page letter. Never miss a note. They can't drive worth spit. <laughs> so you know what? We they don't need to be doing like both. That too, but they we don't need to be doing that. both. You yeah. know, and that's yeah. what I tell them. I mean, I, I, I touch base on a lot of different things, but I explain to them this technology stuff is great <clears throat> right up until you put driving and it together. Right. Yeah. They don't. They don't mix. Rick, uh, t talk to me a little bit uh, about uh, Vision Zero here in the city of Columbia. Uh, well. <laughs> the council enacted a Vision Zero policy in late 2016, 2017. And what is Vision Zero? So, Vision Zero came from, uh, originally came from Sweden. Uh, Sweden passed uh, or was, was focused on lowering their um, fatalities. Uh, Missouri is not Sweden. Um, so, you know, how that transfers to the United States. We were the 22nd city to enact the policy uh, in the U.S. Um, we are focused on trying to move that forward, but this stuff is really hard. Um, there's been a lot of people that have been involved in traffic safety, transportation safety for a lot of years, and we are doing a great job at lowering those, but we're still fighting the... What's your biggest challenge? You, you say it's hard. What's, what's, what seems to be the, the... We've talked a little bit up at that end of the table about where some of the challenges are, but from your perspective... Yeah, from a from a citywide perspective, uh, Mayor Turgeon uh, mentioned it. You know, from the enforcement side, we did pass a, a a distracted driving ordinance, but we have those challenges that on a cha on a challenge end if we did try to enforce that. So, from a legislator, it would be better if it was at the statewide level. Um, we uh, we did have two fatalities um, in 2010. Um, we average about somewhere between six and 10 um, or above that. So when you look back at those, that, that time frame, it's like, what were we doing in 2010 that was so good? And, and some of that was we had a very proactive enforcement um, contingent, Curtis Perkins, uh, Krista Schaus-Jones as an audi audience, um, that were working with a lot of people proactively to do better on distracted driving, drunk driving, um, keeping those off the road, we did have lower uh, travel, uh, vehicle miles traveled Fewer at the miles, time. Sure. But when you also look at it is the smartphone was new. Um, so it was two, it's 2008 when the smartphone came out. So I think that does factor into the, the equation. So I think we want to look back at those times when we had good success too. Yeah, we, we talked about the uh, electronic devices and, and so on. Mike, here with the uh, communications industry, what, uh, what's AT&T doing? Well, we've talked a lot about um, education in this segment, and, and that is key. We do a, a lot around that. Um, about 10 years ago, we launched a campaign called It Can Wait. Some of you may have heard of it. It has a lot of resources, itcanwait.com. They're all free, of course. A lot of documentaries. We had a documentary we, we did, uh, we produced with the uh, Missouri Highway Patrol actually but these are nationally available or these are available nationally to anyone that wants to use them and uh, several student organizations have used them um, so th th there's there's lots of resources out there not just these but um, I, it, it's I, th I think it it's helpful I mean we've we've tried to do lots of other things public service announcements you know different types of advertising if you want to call it that for uh, this awareness but it seems that everyone is aware now everyone knows that and we've talked about the research that everyone knows that it's wrong so but some, they do it anyway but they do it anyway and so we do a lot of research around that as well um, I'll mention one thing that the, this is a every every year we have to kind of renew this effort though you know you have to you can't just be spouting the same research time after time and so uh, it, we found a, a new bit of evidence in our most recent research that um, fifty one percent of people are more likely to stop driving distracted if a friend or a passenger pressures them to. And that's kind of what the, the sad folks here were talking about, that, that peer element there. And so 
think about that. Half of the people are just waiting for someone to tell them not to do this. That's pretty powerful. Yeah, it, but it, it's hard it, to get it there. Goes, it goes to the whole concept that we've been talking about here about personal responsibility. I'm responsible for my actions and we need to take it. Um, you, this may be a, a bit of a challenging question for you, but you have technology that could help with this in some area, and I realize that there are competitive pressures and so forth with other carriers. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Well, well, some of the technology, it was mentioned earlier about the apps. Um, that, that we have a good one. It's, it's called Drive Mode. It's, we've had it for years. It's real easy to use. It's free. In fact, it's pre-downloaded on uh, all the Android phones that we have, too. And, and the, the ones that I like when I look at these different apps are ones that are just, that, first of all, ease of use, but also these automatic responses. Uh, we, we, we've talked about the peer pressure of having to respond immediately to a text, and there's a lot of research ar around that, that the expectation is when you send a text is sometimes less than 10 seconds, the sender is expecting a response. Well, even the technology can help with that too when you have an automatic re response built into the app that says, I'm driving right now, I'll get back with you as soon as possible. So you're taking some, I guess, relief to that, that's, that anxiety, I guess, to that, that you're expressing to that sender that, yeah, I, I heard you, not really, but I heard you, and I'll get back with you, so. Message it, received, it, it, in yeah, other words, yeah, so, and yeah. So, so, and it's those types of technologies that I think we can build on and, and enhance to mm -hmm. get more into how people think about responses and social media, and then what the expectations it's are. It's that whole mental wiring thing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, great, thank you. We are going to move to enforcement now here. So, uh, um, Officer Eric, um, you had your hand up, so. Uh. So I think a lot with these apps is that people have to be willing to put them on their phone, the whole personal responsibility, and until we start pulling at heartstrings, I don't think we're gonna get there. So several years ago, I went to a conference and I heard a man speak about how he lost his daughter to a distracted driving incident, and he asked this question of the entire group. And I'll ask it to you guys now, and I probably won't do it nearly as good a justice as he did. But he said, do you find distracted driving dangerous? If you do, raise your hand. Come on, folks. Oh. Does anybody think it's not dangerous? Let, we'll do the, so, the opposite. Well, no, so, uh, okay, you think it's not? No, Oh, so, no, you, so got, you, you got to <laughs> stick job, with Andy. us now. We're moving quickly here. So. so leave your hand up if you have kids, family, friends that you drive around regularly. Okay. Would you do anything for those people that you're driving around? Would you lay down your life for your kid, for your family, for your friends? Okay. Leave your hand up if you're also driving and texting. Right? If you're going to say that you'll lay your life down for your child, how can you be the one putting them in that harm's way? And that clicked for me so hard. How could I, as a police officer, I put my life down for way more than just my family, way more than my kids, I'm putting it down for, for everybody. So how can I sit there on the road every day and have my cell phone in my hand? And everyone has to find whatever that message is in their head to put their phone down. Is this end of the table listening to that? That sounds like a pretty good technique here. So just something to think about. Uh, you might remind them again afterwards <laughs> when we get to the, uh, to the next break. But... Uh, Really good point. Um, so, um, Sergeant Perkins, what about from your view? Um, I realize you probably see a lot of this out on the roads, and yet you can't do anything about it, or can you? Well, here in Columbia, we do have the distracted driving ordinance. Speaking of the mic. <laughs> here in Columbia, we do have a distracted driving ordinance. It doesn't specifically mention cell phones in it. It talks more about grooming, drawing and writing while driving. Eating spaghetti. Uh, anything it takes your... <laughs> Anything takes your eyes off the roadway for, you know, where it should be. It's the way the distracted driving is written. However, the key to everything is just like our other traffic issues that we face, like speeding. I mean, you know, there's enforcement only goes so far. It's enforcement education. At some point, it's going to take a culture change and have voluntary compliance. Have you had any... Um What's been the conversation with some of the people uh, that you've had, and I'll put this to all of our law enforcement people, so we've, we've made it pretty clear that we think DUI has a lot of similarities between this. Um, <coughs> Officer Eric, if you've stopped somebody for DUI, 
do they give you a rights lecture that uh, you know they're entitled to do this right up to the point of impact, or how does that work? No. They don't? <laughs> Not quite, no. Okay. <laughs> Captain John, any thoughts from you on the enforcement side of things? Well, certainly enforcement is a challenge. What we're having to do now is if you see someone who is texting or distracted in whatever way, then we look for a violation that they commit to take that. So if they are, you know, failing to drive within a single lane or they're, you know, the light turns green and they just sit there or, you know, those types of things. So we're having to look for that additional unsafe behavior before we take the enforcement action. So that's kind of where we're at with the, you know, with the, the laws that we have on them. If you had a law, and um, I think it was you, Carrie, who said something about that they had effective laws for, for being able to, to do the enforcement? Did I remember correctly? Yeah, there are states that are very good at enforcement, and we can look at those examples of exactly what law enforcement does, and not getting into all the details, but there was some very easy, like, undercover could, could work. Could you just and, share some of those with us? Do you, do you remember any of them? Well, one of them was even, like, an undercover type of situation, and I say undercover, where maybe an unmarked vehicle that was watching very easily. You can so easily see what's happening, and they talked about just the, the uh, there were there were many enforcement techniques and, and finding the the states that do it very well and, and it works and it's it's easy it's easily done and it's easily documented and and we know we see it visually every day well so does law enforcement so there are ways that they can you know, one thing one thing that might help we, we talk about fines and things like that there's nothing like a five hundred dollar fine to really focus your attention but it would seem like uh, as part of the uh, perhaps a communications campaign is to say any fines that we collect are going to be used specifically for preventing more distracted driving and possibly to go to some of the uh, families and victims that are involved so it doesn't go into the, the, the uh, you know, general fund. And I think also just the personal enforcement piece too is important and I know I had a conversation with a high level executive in a company and it surprised me when I talked about how we he was talking about the legislature and his initiatives and I said I'm really working on this distracted driving and he said oh well he admitted to me that he has to use his phone because he's so very important he's got to use it while he's driving and and I thought well I said well I guess I mean you don't have to follow the law just as if you choose if you're gonna follow the speed limit or not so like with these other laws it doesn't mean he necessarily has to. He makes that choice, but if he chooses not to... Suffer the consequences. Right. And I think the risk versus reward is why we're having a hard time with personal uh, enforcement with people. And learning the psychology, the psychology part was very important for me, too, to understand why, the why piece of why we are doing this and how, until we know the why, we can't necessarily change uh, the behavior and for the personal enforcement piece, but not realizing just how powerful the psychology of it is. Hold that thought. Susan. I just wanted to add to some of the comment that Major, uh, Mayor Turgeon was making regarding other states and enforcement opportunities. Um, as part of the You Drive, You Text, You Pay campaign last year, there was a Speak up. C to D uh, enforcement techniques, and that's connect to disconnect and as part of that campaign there were different types of enforcement techniques that states who had laws uh, were utilizing and they used spotters so they would have law enforcement that would be standing on roadside and they would have a law enforcement in a car stationed elsewhere and they would call them out and they would get them they also had roving patrols so they would have two officers in a car. One would be the, basically the eyes to be watching, and the other one obviously driving to then pull them yeah, over. It wouldn't be good for an officer to have a distracted driving. Exactly, so. yes. So they have, there was two officers in the car. And then they, they utilized motorcycle patrols because um, if you, you know, obviously a motorcycle can pull up next to a car fairly close, and they can easily look over and see. And then also they have intersection enforcement where they would have them stationed at intersections and they would call them out so others uh, would, you know, another officer stationed elsewhere would get them. So those are different types of enforcement techniques that uh, can be used and especially it's very effective where states that have these laws. So there is hope. So if, if the laws were passed, 
there could be an effective way and a fair way of enforcing them. Is, is, is that a fair statement? Yes, and I also found one particular state, Delaware, talked about their techniques of enforcement. Like you mentioned, the unconventional vehicles, unmarked pickup trucks, they get higher than the violator. They can see it easily. The effective times of the day, using strategies to defeat you know, sunlight, the location of the officers, um, using sheriffs and county vehicles, coordinating with commanding officers, targeting certain rich environments where they know this is happening, hot spots, um, increasing their visibility. Just even being there can keep people from picking up their phone if they just see the vehicle. Um, they mentioned using dump trucks, coordinating with Department of Transportation where bucket trucks and elevated vehicles could, could see better than others. So uh, it was very interesting to hear. I mean, there were so many. I was starting to just try to take notes of, of all the techniques that they use for, for enforcement. But other states do it, and they do it well, and we could too here in Missouri. Excellent. I notice you have uh, a couple of um, items here. Would you like to hold those up? So uh, well, I'd Peter be happy to. I don't know if I'm the only mayor in the state that travels with my own phone, buckle up, phone down, <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down here. But yeah, every mayor should, if they don't, buckle up, phone down, and you all should too. And I really think that taking this in our own hands, I'll tell you what I love about buckle up, phone down. When I went to the uh, MoDOT, uh, or to a traffic safety conference in the state of Kentucky in April, mm -hmm. And was so impressed because I was doing the buckle up, phone down, and so many people said afterwards, what is that? Because they were from all over the country. And how cool it was that despite that we don't have the law, we actually have this amazing buckle up, phone down. And so many people it's from other states. It's a fabulous logo. They were talking about, what is that? That's so cool. And I didn't realize, I thought it was a nationwide thing. And so other states are adopting that. So good for MoDOT. For, I mean, the okay, MoDOT is people, you have an opportunity here. You can go national with this thing. We're trying. <laughs> we intend to. Um, that's a platform piece uh, for this year at Ashto. We're taking it Excellent. National. I'm going to quote Yoda, do or do not. There is no try. Okay, so make it happen. So that's, that's great. I'm, I'm, I like that. And by the way, that's about, when I wear those things, it's about as good as I am with my phone. Well, I I'm have more. Let me wait. Wait a minute. And I also uh, carry Barrel Bob with me. So hashtag Barrel Bob, if you look up my social media. Uh, any media I do, uh, if you get an email from me, my uh, signature line has hashtag buckle up phone down. So every email I send has that on there. What are ways that we can do to get our message out. So it is out there. This sounds like something for SAD to pick up uh, as well as... Uh, come on down. We're ready. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I want to come down all the way to the end of the table here for uh, Curry on. You have a critical role here in all of this because when you speak, people listen. Um, you've been hearing a lot here. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, so... Obviously, as a member of a media, a lot of people look to us, and I've actually worked with MoDOT, John Nelson. I did an enterprise piece about texting and driving, so I worked with, with MoDOT, the Missouri State Highway Patrol, and also um, Senator Wayne Wallingford, who proposed a bill for distracted driving, and I spoke to some people just like on a college campus, and I think a lot of people just think, and I've worked with different police departments around locally, too, that... People think just because it hasn't happened to them that it won't happen at all. So I think as members of the media, hearing from people's stories, I mean, and just for an example here, I spoke with a girl who said her life was in jeopardy. And that really hit hard for me because being part of the media, you're constantly connected. So to, have, to hear somebody say that their life was in jeopardy because of another distracted driver, that really hit hard close to home. And there was a time where she said there was a semi a semi-truck driver drove into the back of her car at a stop sign. So I think putting these people, speaking with real people, allowing people, because we can put the MoDOT statistics up on the screen. It's a statistic. Exactly. It's, it's not a tragedy or a reality. Exactly. And so, like people have said before, we're being a little too soft on this. We are. Um, but she said there was another time, and the same girl said that she, another distracted driver, um, ran into the back of her and... The driver didn't have insurance, so she was left to pay for her own medical and her own car get to get a new car. So she was like, this has to stop. But her experience, she's turned that into speaking with youth. But I think to be able to just like, that's why it's important for the people. We love talking to real people. So if you have a story, share it. 
reach out to your media legislators. They need to hear it as well. How could you, in your position, kind of get to the public at large? I mean, that's what you do every right. every evening. But to to really, we've heard it probably at least 15 times today. You know, the public letting the legislature know, and also the education aspect of this. How how could you and your fellow media people? Uh, communicate this that's what you're you're in the communications business right how what any thoughts on on uh, are there uh, uh, when your editors get together do you talk about this and say hey we've got this coming up and we we'd like to make a push that uh, KRCG 13 wants to really bring this forward so that everybody understands where we stand right and that's part of the reason why I'm here today so I'm very thankful to be on this and after I finish up here, I'll actually be covering the buckle up phone down day. So I will be pushing that for us to get Good that out you. there. So Good it's definitely, it's, it's critical. It's critical. Joshua, you see uh, the aftermath in a lot of these things. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, just the public perception of it's not going to happen to me is something that uh, is very easy for people to think on a day to day basis. Uh, and the realization that tragedy can strike at any time, uh, like you were saying before, with, within three seconds of, of not knowing that it's coming is something that's critical uh, that for people to understand that every moment they're on the road is, is an opportunity for them to make a mistake and be distracted. So I think uh, the recognition of that is important. Um, one of the other things I was thinking about with the education, uh, is there a way to incorporate um, better education to our drivers? So you as a pilot and I as a physician, we have to have continuing education every so often to make sure that we're safe to operate. Even without a legislative measure, is there a way of providing that education to renew your license or to get your initial license or to graduate out of a, uh, the graduated driver's license um, uh, program? Just so people understand and have uh, good facts, both with a uh, um, the factual knowledge, but also some personal story it could be a very effective way in the state of Missouri to, to lead forward with that and do it in a way that's not very burdensome or too time consuming, but simple messages to, to be able to renew a license, I think would go a long way. Doug, any uh, thoughts from you uh, on this particular topic of education, legislation, and enforcement? Sure. It, um, uh, I believe the term was villainized that you used earlier. So. Oh, I, I strongly <laughs> believe that we um, need to communicate in our media um, the villainization of this. I think that um, there are a lot of good programs out there. We've heard of some of them th this morning. Um, but the bottom line is that we need to change the culture. And um, I hearken back to what we did with um, drunk driving. We villainized it. Um, this is acceptable conduct. That's why so many people are engaging in it. We need to make it unacceptable. And so I believe that uh, we're gonna get to the kids, we're gonna get to the lawmakers, uh, when we start making this conduct just unacceptable. I uh, have a commercial in mind where a driver is putting their hand up to their ear with a phone. And at the same, then the next scene is, it's a whiskey bottle, phone, whiskey bottle. One of the ways we could villainize it is by associating it with drunk driving, which we all think is unacceptable. That's an interesting uh, observation. Mm -hmm. uh, you all have been really good out here in the audience, and I haven't had the opportunity to pick on you very much. So uh, uh, you've been listening here, been very, uh, well behaved, as I say. Uh, any thoughts, comments, concerns, any other views? I realize this is pretty much a homogeneous group, but uh, I don't, yes, sir. Hold on, hold on. We're, Nicholas is coming over. I was just going to say that I agree with the attorney who says it needs to be villainized. I, for so many years, I've wondered why we haven't made a much larger issue of it, that it should be because it does have the same traumatic effect as DUIs. Why wouldn't sure. we put this in the same category with it and treat it the same and, and view it the same? Excellent point. Um, 
So again, I'm pushing on takeaways here and action. We're going to get to that uh, as we get to the end of the last panel. But I'd like everybody here to think about, everybody here in the audience, what are you going to do as a result of the discussion here today? It's not enough for us to just say, okay, yeah, I heard, I believe. If we're going to make the difference so that the House of Representatives can do something, they need to hear from the public. Uh, Jennifer knows this uh, as well as anybody. So anybody else got some ideas or thoughts on what they can do? Catherine. So there are a lot of great programs out there that we know, and I know my friends at SAD have mentioned some of them. But uh, so I want to emphasize the role that parents play. We also have at National Safety Council a very good program called Drive at Home, which involves parents and students. But I also want everybody, I agree with you, I think we need to villainize it, but that's a really hard thing to act, put action into place for. So one of the things I know as a parent, I also have a teen driver, I know that in the schools, coaches and teams and clubs can be very influential to how these kids act. So I agree that it's a great idea to maybe take an idea to a parent-teacher organization or even talk to your athletic director at the school and ask them to cover part of their presentation on distracted driving. So every school in the fall or spring does a kind of orientation session where they talk about the sports or activities for that particular session going on. They cover things like concussion training. And they make kids do concussion training. They make kids also give them information now on the dangers of opioids. Why not have these kids the, learn about the dangers of distracted driving? And why not have the coaches be the role, role models for them and say, you know what? We're not going to accept this. If Buckle I see up, you pulling down. up, Buckle except up, here thumbs in, down. Except here in Missouri, Absolutely. where older people can, can do this. Right. But let's use the people who are the influencers in the lives of these young people, help these young kids get to where they need to be. If not the parents, the coaches, the teachers, directors of clubs, band leaders, these are really people that we can go to automatically and let them start making a difference with these kids. Great, thank you. Deanna. I'd like to challenge each of you in the audience, but first I have to tell you about a couple of programs. Think First Missouri has been a part of the University of Missouri for many, many years. We have Think First for Teens, and we have uh, Think First for our Parents, which is called First Impact. So we go into schools, sure. businesses, all kinds of organizations, and we present programs about all the things we've been talking about, distracted driving, impaired driving, uh, traumatic brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, how to prevent those. We're constantly in the schools, and we're constantly in front of parents. And I'm going to just point out a couple of our partners are here. MoDOT, Highway Safety, funds these programs. State Farm Insurance funds these programs. We partner with the Highway Patrol, and we part, we're a part of the University of Missouri. Uh, some of our instructors are in here. Trent Brooks, MoDOT, is one of our instructors. All of uh, Captain Hotz's public information officers are our instructors. So I would challenge each of you, and I'm going to tell you these are awesome programs, and we get invited back all the time. Little Town of Hallsville, are you familiar with that? We had 40 people last night at Hallsville. I was actually shocked, so <laughs> pretty excited. So I challenge each of you. There is a program right here at Mizzou, Think First Missouri. Go back to the school in your community. Go to your churches, your 4-H groups, your in boys and girls clubs, anything like that, and say, hey, there's a really cool program where you can learn about all these um, safety messages. And it is, there is no cost to the host of the programs and no cost for people to attend because MoDOT Highway Safety cares enough about you and the people in Missouri to fund these programs as does State Farm and Encompass Health. So I just ask each of you to please go back to your communities and if you would like my contact information to figure it out or just Google Think First Missouri and you will find all of our information, I would love to get in your communities to help save lives. Thank you. Nicholas. Yeah, I just wanted to, in terms of the law, I know we have the teen driver safety component, Nicholas World and TSB, but one of the things I was having a couple of discussions with a couple of the panelists last night is we have the teen driver safety law, however, we don't have a law for adults. For you that are driving here in Missouri, 
what are the teens, what are your younger children t um, asking you? If they're, they're seeing you driving distracted or someone driving distracted or using their phone, what kind of, what, what are the kids saying? I would be curious to know because Rick uh, and you as sad, you know that we know and all as adults, children are modeling what they see. They learn more from what they see than what you say at the end of the day. So the law is on the books at the end of the day. Uh, and any, anyone can weigh in on that? What are, what are the teens telling you? Um, I, as a teen myself, uh, I would say that there's a lot of teens that when you talk to them about why it's dangerous, the answer that you get is, well, my parents do it. My sister in college does it. And so the way that they're modeling is they're saying it, well, phones are legal. You know, for them, driving's legal. They just see two legal things, and they're only seeing a legal thing plus a legal thing. They think it's legal. And in some states, it's legal. Some states, it's not. But the internal, is this morally right? And is this going to end the life? You know, they're not thinking about that. They're only thinking, this is good, this is good, I shouldn't have a problem with this. Yeah, and at the same time, I, I mean, for you here in Missouri, I do believe there's a missing part, there's a missing piece of the puzzle. You have to pair up the two. If you don't pair up the two, there are two... Conflicting messages being sent. One, you're telling the teens, don't, you're, you're, you're saying to the teens, you're saying to the teens, don't drive distracted, but yet you're saying, as an adult, I can do it, and it's okay. So those two messages somehow, some way, need to be connected and paired up. Thank you. Okay, this brings us to the end of our second panel. The third one is going to be corporate policy and regulation. Let's take 15 minutes, no longer, and uh, network, tr trade business cards, and, and contact information, and we will start in 15 minutes.